Hi everybody, I'm Ilya with Near Protocol. We're here actually at East New York right now and recording a whiteboard series with John from New Cypher. Please, John, introduce yourself and we can dive right in. Sure, I'm John uh, from New Cypher, also known as Tux. Uh, I'm a cryptography engineer at New Cypher and we build cryptography protocols and uh, that for decentralized applications and distributed applications uh, that allow people to achieve more privacy and more security in their applications. Awesome. How does it work? <laughs> sure. All right. So first, the basis of our network is uh, called proxy re-encryption. So I'm going to go ahead and just dive right in and explain what proxy re-encryption is. To give you an overview, we'll see. It's P-R-E. That's just proxy re-encryption. Um, so what, I'm just going to diagram this out a little bit. So normally, we're very familiar with Alice and Bob's uh, <laughs> public key, right? So we'll say Alice has her key. I'll call, actually, I'll call this key. Oh. And then Bob also has his public key. So what happens with proxy re-encryption is actually this transformation from when we encrypt something here with Alice's public key. Mm -hmm. So Alice can encrypt some data. So we'll call this like an encryption function here. And we pass in a pub with some data like this. And we'll say we'll get C. Sorry, if you can't, the C equals encrypt the encryption of, of this data with Alice's public key. Um, so, so C A. So this is what's happening here is that Alice is encrypting data with her public key, and it, typically what we know is we also have her private key, and so Bob also has a private key as well. Now, if Alice wants to decrypt this data, she, normally she would call a decryption function using her private key. On this, okay. on the C, yeah. Yeah. No worries. We'll just go to C. I'll, I'll erase this really quickly too, because we're going to be moving on. <laughs> uh, so now we have like this. So this is an asymmetric encryption algorithm. Um, and it, as you can see, what's just happening here is that Alice is calling this decryption on this encrypted ciphertext with her private key and getting that data out that she encrypted here. This is the basis of what we call, you know, public key cryptography and everything. So what we're going to do now is explain how proxy re-encryption works with this kind of context and setting, because everybody's familiar with Alice encrypting data for Bob and Bob encrypting data for Alice mm -hmm. and so back and forth. But proxy re-encryption allows us Alice to encrypt data with her public key and then delegate access to that encrypted ciphertext to any person she, she wants. Mm -hmm. So with this in mind, let's go yeah. ahead Oh, thank you. <laughs> so we'll leave up this first function here, CA. And what happens is we also have a delegating uh, key that we call a re-encryption key. So we'll go ahead and explain how everything fits in here with some algorithms uh, that right here. Proxy re-encryption has five, five different algorithms. So we'll go one. This is key generation. So we'll call it Key gen. Mm -hmm. There's another one that is uh, encrypt. A third one, decrypt. Fourth one, this is re key gen. And the fifth one is re encrypt. So we'll go into exactly what each function takes and does. But keygen is pretty obvious. It just outputs a new key, key pair. Yeah, just a new key pair. Like that. Encrypt is very obvious, given the input of a public key and some data, D. We get a ciphertext. And then on decrypt, Give an input of a private private key and some ciphertext. 
we get our beta. And then on Rekeygen, this is where proxy encryption kind of gets like its big interesting component is that we can actually generate in at least in Umbral. So I'm going to go over, there's a variety of uh, proxy encryption algorithms, but what NewCypher uses is called Umbral. So I'll write this here. This was developed by a by one of our photographers, uh, David Nunez. Um, so we keep it here. It takes Alice's private key and then Bob's public key. And on the output, we actually get what are like shares. So we get in this case, I'll actually, you know, I'm gonna extend this. No, actually, I'll keep it simple for now and just talk about Rekeygen mm -hmm. so we can get an overview. And the, on the output, we get what we call a rekey. And we'll say this goes from Alice to Bob to Bob mm -hmm. right there. And then reencrypt simply takes this uh rekey. Re yep. And the uh, ciphertext. Yep. And on the output, we now get a C ciphertext. So if this is for for yeah, Alice's we'll key. We'll say yeah. up there, and we'll say for like somebody else. This on the output gives you a ciphertext from of B. Mm -hmm. So what's happening here is when you call this reencrypt key, or this reencrypt function, it's transforming transforming uh, the ciphertext that's encrypted under Alice's key to Bob's public key. Mm -hmm. And so Bob can decrypt it with his own private key, just like in this function here. So Umbral does things a little bit differently. In a new cipher, this actually isn't secure in, any, in the setting that we need. Because mm -hmm. if you know, obviously we don't want somebody to have a component that is both Alice's private key and Bob's public key, right? So, because uh, if you know Bob's public key, you can usually derive Alice's private key from that thing. So what we want to do is make it secure in a decentralized setting. Mm -hmm. We use threshold cryptography to solve this problem. So I'll get into that a little bit later. And so I'll just draw an arrow here for <laughs> threshold cryptography. Sorry, my handwriting is horrible, by the way. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so what we're gonna do now is explain how this kind of narrative fits in here. So we have a ciphertext of Alice. And she, and say Bob Dell wants access to this ciphertext here. So what Alice is going to do, Alice is going to call this function uh, rekeygen. She's going to pass in her private key and Bob's public key. And we're going to get this, uh, this remainder here, which is this, we'll just call it RK to a to B. Mm -hmm. All right. So with this re-encryption key that we have now, now we can Alice, encode. Yeah. Then. Exactly. We can just do. I'll just run through the same thing we did here. We can do re-encrypt with uh, R K A to B and this ciphertext A. So we're putting in Alice's encrypted ciphertext for her key, and then this re-encryption key, and the output, we'll get C, B. Mm -hmm. What just happens here is literally what we call like an atomic transformation, meaning at no point in time is the ciphertext actually decrypted. The ciphertext just gets transformed from one ciphertext to another. So there is never a... Uh... <laughs> so there's never actually a, uh, uh, a another... There's no private material re revealed by yeah, yeah. performs this computation. So now Bob can simply just do, if he wants to retrieve this data, he just calls decrypt. Yeah, decrypt with his key. Yep, with his. And then you see, like that. That way, nothing is ever revealed in this mm -hmm. process. New Cypher is a network that allows people to do this. So it's perfect for decentralized applications where somebody needs to control their key, like they have control of their data but they don't want to, they want to delegate access to it. So sometimes people are familiar with the key management uh, kind of thing, right? So in key management, typically you encrypt the secret, you store it somewhere else, and then you just request access from somebody else to decrypt that secret, mm -hmm. right? So uh, 
in this case, password encryption actually fits that really well. So if you're building a D app, and say you want to share data with a, that application, mm -hmm. um, you typically just want, you, you just encrypt the data. Using, using the new cipher network, you can delegate access to that the application or another person, and then they can decrypt it uh, using the network. So the network will transform that cipher text to be decrypted along with your key. So what would be like a use case, like an example of application to use so, this for? One use case we have is uh, medical data sharing. So, mm -hmm. for example, you have a uh, you're a patient and you have a doctor. Uh, let's say you move somewhere mm -hmm. and you don't want your old doctor having access to your information anymore. Mm -hmm. This is like a, a climbing, you know, an increasing use case. Where yeah, people yeah. Are wanting more medical privacy, especially in Europe and, and Asia. GDPR, well, yeah. Seen, yeah. Um, so, in that case, you can delegate access to your doctor to have access to your medical history. And if they, you know, if you move away, you can revoke access. Revoke the access. Yeah. So in this case, what this looks like here is that this re-encrypt here is actually stored by a third party. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, this re-encryption is done by, by a third, third party. party. So I'll say performed. Performed by a third party. This is also the new cipher. Yeah, no, no, nodes, we, nodes in the network. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So nodes in our network stake our token, and they earn the they earn the uh, the inflation rewards uh, by performing reencryptions. So there's a few little problems here that I'm going to that I'm going to explain as well, and how things work like this. Uh, but to solve a fundamental problem we have now, I'll just explain how the threshold cryptography part works. Sure. So let's go ahead and just erase this. <laughs> Uh, since I feel like we have this yeah, I think we. figured out, I'll add in a thir this threshold cryptography component. So we'll be modifying the rekey gen function just a little bit to put out M of N shares. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure if you're not familiar with Shamir's secret sharing, it's a very simple concept. You have a secret. So we'll say Shamir's secret sharing. What this is, is we have this algorithm, uh, split, secret, or an input, we take some secret. Usually, you know, people use this a lot with Bitcoin private keys, yeah. so they can split it up among their friends and family, and if they, can't, if they need to recover it, they can just go to them and say, hey, Collect I need my share. Yeah. Yeah. Multi-sig, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So we also take these threshold components, and we say, okay, I'm going to generate, I need uh, let's say I need three shares. Out of five. Out of five, right? Mm -hmm. And then when I do that, I get these shares. So <laughs> I made no room for myself, so I'll do it over here. Ah, that's horrible. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so I'll just call it shares. <laughs> S. That's horrible. <laughs> so we have shares that they generated there, and then they can go and recover these. If they, and like I said, they only need three. To collect so as a data back, the secret back. Yep. This is the threshold, and this is the total. Mm -hmm. On the new cyber network, we call these values M of N. And you'll typically hear this referred to as M of N secret sharing. So uh, we'll call this here M. M. So with that explained, now we can do the same thing for this re-encryption key that we generated here, where we input that as the secret. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me erase this, and I'll dive right into that. So this time I'll leave room for myself. And so we call rekey gen, and on input we take our Alice's private key, Bob's public key, and then our threshold, so we'll say three to five, like that. Mm -hmm. And on the output, we get a list of our okay. chunks. Yep. One, two. So th this uh, Rike Jan is done by Alice in this case, right? Yep. Alice is the one who performs this. Now go over exactly what I can like label that out if need be. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, so we generate five different re-encryption key shares, and each one of these. Since we, since if you're familiar with Shamir's secret sharing and how what the the privacy of that is, each share alone. 
has no yeah it's not enough yeah yeah it's what we call perfect secrecy Mm -hmm. um so it's not alone to recover the entire secret so this is what we call collusion resistance where now it's we're requiring nodes on our network they would have to collude with each other to recover the secret and even if they did recover the secret they cannot the only thing they could do is transform cybertext from alice's key (laughs) to bob's key right so it kind of hurt some of that uh that revocation that we talked about so when our nodes revoke on the network, by the way, revocation is simply just telling the nodes, hey, delete your shit. Mm-hmm. And that's it. And all we need is just a you know a maximum threshold. So in this case, we just need three shares of these five to be deleted, and nobody will ever have access to that uh, key again. So what happens now is that Alice is going to delegate access. So we'll say A, and we'll have five nodes. Oh, bad square. Five nodes. Not about <laughs> But each one is given a share. Yep. Right? So she just finds whoever pretty much staked new cipher token. Yep, these are distributed these are distributed based on how much somebody stakes on our network. So what we do is we select a random sample on the network. Mm-hmm. and then distribute tokens based off this. So we use Ethereum for this. Um, not really a requirement. We just need to be able to have somewhere we can You need perform. some consent. Yeah, yeah some we need consensus, some consensus yeah. mechanism to be able to determine who to give these, frag- these fragments to. And so each one of these nodes on our network receives this re-encryption key frag. And then she says, she tells the Bob. So Alice now says, all right, I'm going to find a Bob. And so since she generated for Bob here, what happens all right. Uh, what happens is Bob will simply go to the network, and we'll put this as like a since we know that our network has mul- has tons of people on it to avoid drawing it out over and over. Again, mm-hmm. I'm just going to call this like just one big box, the network. <laughs> Hopefully that doesn't confuse anybody. But Bob will call a uh, retrieve function, and what happens is he just talks to the network here. And on the output, he will get what is essentially a ciphertext for himself. Mm-hmm. So what he does is he sends this component, the CA. So Bob is actually using... Oh, Bob here. sends a CA. Yeah, so Bob will send okay. this encrypted... So Alice sends pretty much to Bob a CA. Yeah. Alice will encrypt some data, mm-hmm. like you said here. Yeah, we yeah. get a ciphertext. She gives this to Bob. She can store this on like IPFS, whatever. Um, she gives this to Bob. And then Bob can just go to the network with that CA, and each node on the network performs this re-encrypt with their share. Mm-hmm. And then at the end, Bob does like this whole uh, combination. Yeah, of he does this. the combination. Like typically, when you have this your secret sharing scheme, you perform that combination, and you recover the secret. So he only needs to actually pick. So there's three different net nodes that he can pick from here. Mm-hmm. So in reality, he's actually only picking like a certain subgroup of this. You know, it could be here, yeah, here. Yeah whatever right so there's uh, plenty of nodes on the network depending on how much your share usually is you can go to the network and, and do that with different efficiency different performance parameters and like uh so now when it's he has it encrypted uh or re-encrypted for his key he just calls that decrypt function with his own private key just like as if he had encrypted it with his own key mm-hmm. right and now he gets it's a message yeah yeah so that's the that's like the basis of how the new cipher network works. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of different applications that obviously you can build with something like that. Uh, we're planning on adding a lot more features other than just proxy encryption, I think, to our network, uh, which you know people are really stoked about. Uh, we have our test net up, and uh, yeah, is there? Can I answer any questions for you? Yes, please. Uh, <laughs> so so there's so first question here is. Pretty much, you need this nodes, right? You need this network yeah. because you want to revoke access. Yeah. Because if you never wanted to revoke access, you could have just Alice done this, send it to Bob. Bob now has access to this well, data. Well, see, the problem with giving Bob access to this is that since it's a component of his key, he can actually gain access to Alice's private key with that one. I see. Right. So it, I, it's like a weird. It's like it's, it's like, like we'll go into the mathematics. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's because yeah, the, the yeah, uh, yeah. But so if you just imagine like this being like just a component of each key, 
Yeah. And then we obviously don't want to give Bob access because then he'll be able to find with if he knows the re-encryption key, he'll be able to derive Alice's private key. Mm -hmm. So that's why we split up okay. uh, the nodes across the network. Yeah. They don't know each other. So these nodes don't know. But it's recorded somewhere. You said it's recorded on Ethereum who got the yeah. parts. Because yeah. Bob needs to know also who has the parts. Right. But we have, we actually use something we call the treasure map in our code base, mm -hmm. where that tells Bob where to go, which nodes have the fragments. Mm -hmm. And we also have something called a learning loop so that he can learn about the network very easily and say where to go to and things like that. Yeah. So, But they can like find out who has the parts. If for... they gain access to the treasure map, which is usually encrypted through Bob, directly they can um, but otherwise it's pseudonymous pseudonymous so you know if they can breach that pseudonym pseudonymity oh wow <laughs> um, if they can breach that then yeah they can find out who has access but well i mean you just deploy a contract on ethereum saying put a piece of app of this re-encrypted a to b and i'll pay you like 30 ease yeah sure you can yeah so you can bribe somebody else to do it but you'll find that actually as this number increases too yeah, it yeah, becomes it's, much yeah. more difficult, and so you're now at 30 ETH is like times 3, and you're paying 90 ETH just for a re-encryption key, which you actually can't do anything with. Yeah, you still need you to. You need to be a Bob. Yeah, yeah. So like, well, say, so I'm a Bob, right? In this case, let's yeah, say I'm a Bob. Need all, you need all the Ursulas. You need a minimum threshold of the Ursulas. To and work. to be a Bob. Yeah, and, and to be a the public key. Yeah. Find out yeah. The key. But you know what they could do instead? They just go up to Bob and say, "Hey, can I have the data?" Or they could just try to buy the data from Alice directly, which may be more. You know, like Cheaper. An, an well, yeah. Uh, well, the question is pretty much what's the price of, a, of exactly. a data, right? If the price is million, this is actually. Well, if the price is a million dollars, what you can do is up these numbers really high, so that suddenly it becomes really impossible to actually pay enough to I... recover the data. Okay, but I mean, this question here is also like you have Alice who may be selling a lot of data to all kinds of people, yep. and you bought like some ten dollar data yep. and it was you know re-encrypted by you know five guys but then you go bribe them recover the the re, re key you have the private key for you so you recover the private key for alice and now you have access to all of this data right uh not necessarily or alice uses like so key per yeah, so typically what we actually do is we derive something called a label. Mm -hmm. and so in this case, you're going to, Alice will actually derive, we, we do this as a security measure for just that exact thing. So that way if the recovery attack, the only attack that happens is actually this, this attack here. I see. The other attacks are, you'd have to bribe everybody individually for each piece of data. So, so you, is it because of generating new private key per interaction or? Yep. Well, typically we do it per Bob. Per Bob. And per Bob, per label, per policy. So it's, it's really, it's really, configurable for I how see. you want it. Yeah, so it's like if you're worried about that kind of attack, which we have that by default, so the security is relatively straightforward there for that. Um, in that case, if an attack were to happen, they would only gain access to this $10 data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even then, they don't gain access to Alice's root private key because we derive more keys from that. Um, then she never uses that key by mm -hmm. herself. And then here, so if these person, like, if this person has like, if this is $10 million, if this is $10, but this is like 10k right here. Yeah. yeah. So this actually is never affected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So no. Yeah. I mean, if you have a separate, yeah, separate derived yeah, exactly. key, yeah. So Doesn't that, work that makes that sense. Way. Okay. Right. So that's how we kind of achieve some of that, like uh, forward secrecy in, in the protocol itself. Yeah. Just a little bit. Um, it's kind of it's. I think it's more like weak forward secrecy. It's not perfect forward secrecy. Yeah. I mean, Bob um, can like even if you three walked access from Bob, Bob could have just kept the data, right? Right. And, so, and those folks could have kept the key. Exactly. So when you're building your applications, we typically like to tell people that you know keep in mind that the data that you're sharing, it, you know, it's 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 revocable, but they can only gain act. They can't gain access to future. To the future data. data. Yeah. So in the case of like Netflix, right, or streaming service, yeah, you can encrypt different movies and different packets, but the moment you stop paying for it, you can. Alice will revoke access, where Alice being the application, like the Netflix application or yeah, something, yeah. Um, she revokes access and Bob no longer has access to that data. So obviously there's like some threat modeling people have to do to figure that kind of stuff out. Um, but it's like, a, you know, if you're building like a secret, in the case of like uh, a centralized example being Google Cloud KMS mm -hmm. or Amazon Web KMS, uh, typically people have like secrets for their applications that they need to store, mm -hmm. but they don't know where to store them. So in a decentralized application setting, this is even more difficult because yeah, yeah, yeah. you can't store your secrets in AWS, right? You can't store <laughs> your secrets in Google Cloud. So uh, what we can do is encrypt those secrets, store them in your application locally, mm -hmm. and then 
you you the application owner the manager administrator whatever yeah. you can simply say this node it should be online and then you can uh, give that node access for some time and they can use that and you can just refresh your policies every so often mm -hmm. so in our network we have, our policies have a time component which is how long they can last for mm. um, and but that's kind of arbitrary because you pay for that time and then if at the end you you say oh you've had access long enough I revoke access. You revoke the access. And you need to regenerate the... But you don't need to, if you don't want to regenerate, you don't have to, but you revoke the access and you won't pay for any further time. You'll just pay for the time that was spent there. Um, but yeah. But like, like if, if you're doing this for a key, for like the data is actually some private key for accessing something. Yeah. Then you need to regenerate it, like redo the private key because you uh, revoke the access. You can, but if it's the same Bob, typically you don't. If it's the same person, the same Bob, uh, no, no, I mean, like, if your data is actually a private key to, you know, oh, like, ma like, this is a maker, you know, I see what you're saying. maker control, control key, right? Yeah. And you, like, yeah, you have, you know, a server that, like, doing stuff that you're giving uh, access, you know, for a month, and then, you know, you're like, actually, we don't want this server to have access to this. Sure. Like, they kind of could have kept it somewhere. Yeah, if anything yeah. else is like in right. a cache somewhere, just absolutely, sitting there. Yeah. So, like I said, the threat modeling is absolutely a requirement when you're building yeah. your applications. You know, people, when you see people when they're trying to build stuff on this, like they want to store like their Bitcoin private keys and their Ethereum private yeah. keys on this and be like, oh, that way it's a great way. It's actually not because you don't know who, who has kept it. Yeah. Right? You don't well, know if they kept it or not. Yeah, I mean, if you can like fresh out the key yeah. in like, some more customizable models, yeah. Yeah, more it's, customizable models if you want to, like, are you saying, like, key rotation for this? Yeah, right? yeah, you just rotate the oh, key, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, new set, we don't really have that protocol in New Cypher mm -hmm. for... Uh, rotating uh, the data? Yeah, for, well, for rotating the, uh, the, like, an encrypted private key, yeah, for example. Yeah. That's actually a separate protocol entirely. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, things like that, we would be interested in building models for encrypting private keys for actually keeping those secure. It's just that the security components, we have to really understand what they are first. Um, so that we know how to build these programs without people misusing them. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we've tried our hardest to prevent this kind of thing because we don't think it's a proper security step. Yeah. Uh, so I'm sure you've probably heard the term like misuse resistant cryptography, which is like it's, so it's, it's like it's, you cannot use it wrong. Yeah, you cannot I misuse see. it improper. You cannot misuse it because mm -hmm. right? a lot of times developers will use cryptography wrong. They don't mm -hmm. know that they're using it unsafe. For example, there are really unsafe ways to encrypt data using AES. And if you do it the, the unsafe way... Then yeah, somebody can recover the private key. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we try to build uh, protocols and our APIs and our libraries to actually prevent that from actually happening. It's pretty yeah. cool. So, that's like the fundamentals of uh, proxy re-encryption. The network itself is actually just really simple. It's just a stake, proof of stake network mm -hmm. that we just distribute uh, to K frags. What we call these are called in our network. These are called K frags. And on the output, so each something I will explain here is like just imagine here. This is one node, and these are all different re, and they each have a re key frag here. Mm -hmm. When Bob calls his retrieve. Mm -hmm. to each one of these he's passing along some ciphertext from Alice right? Yeah. What happens is on the output they actually get a uh, like a partial yeah so we actually get a, what we call a C frag I see yeah a fragment of encryption right yeah so what Bob has to do again I'll say Puts this into like a combination function. Mm -hmm. So combine with the C frags. On the output, that's when we get the C C D. What's uh, cryptography behind combination function? Uh, that's actually just mere secret sharing. Very simple. Okay. Yeah. So this uh, this split here, like we talked about here, the yeah, yeah, yeah. This component is just Shamir's. Yeah, she made parts, and then this is like as if you were aggregating signatures. Kind of, yeah. And then this is like, it's like I think it's technically like polynomial inter interpolation. Mm -hmm. That's the technical for the combination function. But yeah, and you only need 
a threshold. So in this case, yeah, you need only three out of five. Yeah, to actually... need, I didn't display the third one, but yeah, you you need only three, so you don't have to actually talk to all five nodes in the network. So so if let's say Bob is like you know querying some of those proof of stake guys, sure, uh, and some of them don't don't respond, uh, is there any repercussion for so, them? So currently, right now, we have a thing where they have to confirm activity on the network to receive mm -hmm. their staking rewards. If they don't confirm activity, then they don't get the staking rewards for that period. How does it confirm activity? Uh, it's, it communicates to a uh, smart contract that says, hey, I'm online from here. Oh, it's just like ping pretty much? Like li liveness ping? Yeah, it's kind of an open problem really. I, like, uh, It's a problem that we have uh, currently because there is no way to actually know if a node is online reliably. Like, It's a component of the uh, of the Oracle problem. There's no way for us to know if a node is online. There's ways, ways we can build around this to kind of determine if a node is online by having them perform some functions, but they all don't really achieve the same like level of security that we actually need for it. But like, why, so let's say you have a smart contract. Yep. Uh, you, Bob just, you know, adds uh, CA to it or like whatever hash in IP, route in IPFS or what, whatnot. And then this guy's add the uh, C frag to associate to it, then you see if they add it or not during some period of time. If they receive it or not? Well, like Bob adds it, right, and you know, pays for it, for yep. example, and then you have well, all, actually, all of Well, pays in this case, but Bob can... Sure, I mean, somebody pays, yeah. But like, pretty much you have them to commit CFRAG on a smart contract. Well, the problem is that we don't want to commit the CFRAG as a smart contract because then, then Alice can never revoke access. Does that make sense? I see. Yeah, so once the, if these C frags were all in a smart contract, then Bob could just go to that smart contract and gain access hey, all the time yeah. when he, whenever he wants. We don't want that. So for some people, that may be okay, but for our protocol, we don't really like that. All this stuff happens off chain, so we can actually have some level of privacy and, and anonymity. Um, not really true anonymity, not really, you know, between the parties because they have to know their keys and everything. Anonymity is actually something we're heavily researching to add to our network in the future. Mm -hmm. um, but with no plans right now, uh, we just launched our test net up uh, with the mainnet coming soon. But I mean, yes, you do it off chain, but like you have, like Bob has the same information. So yeah. like he can just store it in like his logs or whatever. Yeah, you so. can. But we, we still don't want this kind of, we, we don't like- You don't want it discoverable pretty don't, much. We don't want cryptography, like anything, like no cryptographic components stored on the blockchain. It's really like kind of, we don't really consider it very safe to store, you know, ciphertext on the blockchain. That's like the whole point of using uh, new cipher, so you don't have to do that. Yeah. Um, because oh. you never know what kind of computing threats are there. Yes, right? that's true. Yeah. So we don't know. Uh, I mean, you can store hash or whatever in a hash of what you did, and Bob, Bob, if if they pretty much if they try to uh, just put a hash that they did not give to Bob, he can actually like are like. You go into arbitrage mode. Pretty we much. actually have an entire protocol for this that I didn't touch on for security. It's kind of similar to it. Uh, this it does solves a different problem. We've we we're trying really hard to figure out a, a better solution to the uh, liveness and reliability <laughs> factor of it. Because yeah, ideally we'd be able to say nodes who staked and are not reliable, not online. Yeah, yeah, yeah she should kick them out. Yeah, yeah. should kick them out so they don't do anything else. So I'll actually go into a little another explainer. Another misbehavior of the network is what if instead of providing the a proper re-encryption, uh, Ursula, th these are the nodes that we call Ursula, yeah, by the way. They could have given just uh... Yeah, instead of that, they just give some bullshit random garbage data, right? That's a problem, but I will go into the solution there. We use uh, zero-knowledge proofs to prove that re-encryption was oh, done re-encryption is correct? Huh. Yeah. So we can have the output. So imagine... We have our re-encrypt in the umbral scheme. So again, this is another umbral specific thing here. Mm -hmm. What we call re-encrypt, I said it took a uh, re-key. It took a ciphertext from Alice or whoever yep. she's re encrypted to. Um, and then so on the output, we don't just get the C frag that we call it. We actually also get a... Uh, we get our C frag from to B, but we also get a proof. So we'll call this like some proof P. Alright? This proof proves that the re encryption 
was performed correctly. Mm -hmm. So given an input, we can do a verify. On input, we take a proof P, and we take the C frag, the Bob, and you know we just get a, a zero or one. You know, just saying true or false. Yeah, yeah, right? correct or incorrect. Yeah. Yeah, right. So. And if that proof is invalid, if that proof does not verify, yeah, so yeah, if somebody yeah. gave Bob bullshit data, instead we can actually go to a smart contract. So you have a C. Uh, here. You can report the yep. si signed uh, C frag with this yep. proof. And yeah, exactly. You can so verify can it say, on chain. Yeah, so we provide the proof and the signed C frag. Mm -hmm. And then this thing, we call it an, an adjudicator. This thing tells it uh, to punish in a, like yeah, that yeah, specific yeah. node. So then it will, you know, usually what we say is this is like a very severe, serious offense. Yeah, offense. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, oh, you're trying to, you know, abuse the network in some way. Mm -hmm. Just kick them off the network or yeah. take, slash their stake by a significant amount. So how, how long is this uh, proof takes to compute? It's actually, so traditionally in the space, people are, when they hear zero dollar proof, they want to think ZK Snark or ZK Snarks or like some other really complex protocol. But this is such a simple protocol. This re-encryption is technically only an elliptic curve multiplication. Yeah, it's very really yeah. easy. It doesn't take, it's like the performance is, is very minimal. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's similar to a signature verification. So because of the mathematics that it is, we well, can use something called a Schnorr proof. Mm -hmm. So I'll say that the proof is P is... Schnorr is productive. Yeah. <laughs> and all it does, uh, I, I should say similar. Because mm -hmm. you're kind of proving something a little bit different, but same way. Um, so yeah, this P is just a Schnorr proof that can be verified on contract. So we're actually performing this, you know, the same calculation here on the on smart contract. Oh, the actual verification or? Yeah, verification. So verification happens in two places. Oh, I it happens see. Happens by Bob. So Bob will perform verify. I see. Okay. The smart okay. contract also performs this verify. Mm -hmm. I see. And how big is this proof? Uh, it's, on, it's about less than 100 bytes. For any amount of data, pretty much? Per C frag. I see. Yeah. But we don't need to store them all on chain. Mm -hmm. We only need. To, yeah, you only need the one that's offending. Yeah, we only need the proof that's offending. So we actually expect this to like, probably just remain relatively low because there's no way to, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, if people exactly start doing it, they get slashed, and yeah, they, yeah, yeah. So if they do that, and they modify their code to do it. <laughs> have fun throwing your money away. I yeah. Guess, but yeah. So yeah. that's what that, that. That's how that works. Um, but it allows us to kind of. Assure yeah, yeah. Prevent this. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. I mean, yeah. All the slashing is prevention. It's not. Yep. Like, un un unless unless somebody actually like gets a lot of money out of it. Yeah. Yeah, no, you know, like the cool thing is too is that you know when Bob does it, you can say you'll actually get a little bit of reward of new cipher token from the slash stake, mm -hmm. and the, I think we just burned the rest. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so that's that. Like I said, the open problem with what with the discussion you're talking about is this liveness issue. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, as far as we know, there really is no serious answer to this problem. We've been looking for a really long time mm -hmm. in the space for this. Other protocols will simply just say, have other nodes ping another node and say, oh, this node's not online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But obviously, that's not, that's not, yeah. it's not good. Because all the nodes can be like, did you know we can actually DDoS them? Like, yeah, well, it's like, yeah. yeah, yeah like, or like, like just going. agree, yeah, agree we to can, stay as a offline. Yeah, yeah. And in our network, if they can kick other nodes off, they get more, more stuff. Yeah. Certainly, they're incentivized to actually kick nodes off so yeah, they yeah. get more stuff and more money. Yeah, that's always that. like, yeah. Yeah, these that's, solutions for the liveness stuff is really, really difficult. And so far, we're still looking for just a really serious solution to that. I that well, I mean, about. it's pretty much, you need some kind of consensus actually on this to... Yeah, yeah so if liveness is an issue for you, if you're like, we well, we don't think liveness will be an issue. Our staking partners are really, really great people. We're going to keep their nodes online. Yeah. They're really uh, determined to run a ton of nodes and we're actually going to have a fairly robust network uh, yeah. in comparison to other uh, privacy protocols. I think we, I think it's safe to say that we'll probably be one of the most robust networks mm -hmm. in the decentralized space. Um, so yeah, it's more like guardians in a way. This nodes are like guarding this uh, pretty much fragments of keys, yeah, and then they exactly. do this encryption. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, another point here is that you know, uh, since these nodes are you know reliable, if they, let's say we have an unreliable network, what you can do 
is simply up the threshold limit so that m of n value mm -hmm. you can increase n yeah yeah increase yeah. M yeah, n. You... yeah and then you'll actually get you know a certain amount of degree of reliability from that so if one node's offline you can go to the next one that's like the short term for that obviously we are trying to find a solution really hard for that life this thing mm -hmm. but you know it's a it's a hard problem yeah, no, it is. I mean, li liveness is a hard problem everywhere. So, yeah, yep. <laughs> uh, cool. But yeah, that's new cipher. Yeah, really cool. I mean, I'm I'm kind of interested in what's happening underneath here, just like as a. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if you wanna. So well, I will explain now. This was Umbral. I don't want to get into the specifics of, of how. Elliptic Umbral curves. Works. Uh, yeah, I don't want to get into the specifics of how elliptic curves and things like that work. Um, I don't want to say, but I will explain with a very simple math. Okay. Uh, so you can imagine, and this is actually a scheme, so I'll go ahead and erase this. The very beginnings of proxy re-encryption mm -hmm. came from BBS, this paper that was published in 1998, called, and I'll just put the reference here, 98. And this created, essentially, the All right, so this is where this is from. Mm -hmm. Umbral doesn't, so I'll clarify just again, Umbral doesn't do this. Because clearly, in this case, a re-encryption key is a component of Alice's private key and Bob's private key. We don't want Bob's private key. So yeah, we, call yeah. that, we call this interactive proxy re-encryption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't want that. We want it to be non-interactive. So we don't do this. But I'll show you how it works because then maybe you'll get a feel for exactly what's going on. So in a re-key, mm -hmm. in this case, let's say Alice wants to generate a re-encryption key from her to Bob, like yep. in our old setting. Re-key gen... We'll then take a component of Alice's private key and Bob's private key. Again, we don't do this in your cipher. <laughs> <laughs> so on the output of this, we get a math, a math equation very similar to just... Just like that. Mm -hmm. Bob's, public key, Bob's private key divided by Alice's private key. Actually, so that's that when you mu multiply it by the encrypted message, yeah, you're pretty much like removing yeah, the thing. Yeah, so if you're familiar with Elgamal and how that yeah, works, yeah. It's, it's like I private key by C. Yeah. yeah, so what I'll say is it's, it's kind of similar to where now it's like if you have a typical key or like some message where it's like, you know, some randomness that's encrypted with like, uh, and if, you don't, if you're not familiar with the elliptic curve cryptography, I may lose some folks here. <laughs> Yeah, then, you know, like, Google, there's like <laughs> pretty yeah. good articles about it. <laughs> yeah, so we have, we have a generator point G. And, you know, in Elgamal ciphertext, they look like, you know, uh, R, A, where A is Alice's private key. So this is something that's been encrypted for yeah. Alice. If we multiply this by our... Uh, B divided. Yeah. B priv, yeah, right, A priv, yeah. It's pretty clear to see what happens. We have G to the R A. Oh, actually, I'll just. Why am I doing that? I'm not in math class anymore. <laughs> just, so what I can do is this. This is like, like it's like it maybe a stretch for some people. <laughs> G to the R. To the B. B. Yeah. And so now we've actually created this ciphertext. So this actually itself. Is a ciphertext A. And this yeah, is now ciphertext B, yeah. Ciphertext B. Again, new cipher does not use the private key <laughs> of Bob. We, we do something differently here. Um, but yeah, so G to the R A times B priv over A priv uh -huh. cancels out G to the R B. That's that. It's very, very simple. So this this right here, this multiplication is the re encryption function. So right Yeah. That's re encrypt. Mm -hmm. and this. This is a, yeah, key, re key. Re, yeah, I already. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's that. All right, cool. Yeah, it's relatively similar. And then now you can start seeing exactly where the Shamir secret fits in. Because now we take this, we can put this as an input to. Just, yeah. And then we have the R, K, A to, to B. Link, yeah, and just and, split it off, yeah. And, like that, and now you have kind of something like that, and then now you yeah, you get like B, like pri yeah, like B one, B two, B three, B four, yeah. Yeah, B two, 
Yeah, then yeah. you just multiply them and you get, yeah, get you it just, back in. Yeah. Then you just put all those fragments back in the function, the same thing. Yeah. yeah. So that's, it's like kind of touching on a little bit of like uh, threshold cryptography, multi party. Yeah, yeah. There. But yeah, that's, this is pretty much how that works mathematically. It's extremely simple. Mm -hmm. It's one of the more simple cryptographic protocols. But the reason why, the one thing that we find really interesting about proxy encryption is that it's now kind of catching on again just a little bit more um, because people are realizing, oh, in decentralized and multi party scenarios, actually not a bad thing well i mean we got to a stage where we can actually coordinate this yeah. before so, we couldn't so. yeah exactly so now before 98 when this came out what you had to do is actually trust this component here which is yeah, yeah. i mean these guys need to get together pretty much yeah. and do this yeah exactly and this is extremely toxic material right yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and so in the case the attack that we explained earlier where that collision happens if we have b priv and a priv Clearly, if we know any, yeah, key, any way you can restore both. Like, yeah, exactly. So you can just be like, you can just do. If you have a priv, yeah, you. A priv. Oh, I'm sorry. That's fine. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just did this wrong. I'm sorry. But anyway, like, but yeah. if you have a priv, you can get, get b priv. If you get priv, b yeah. priv, you can get a priv. Right. Yeah. So if you know if you know b priv, you can find a priv. If you know a priv, you can get b priv. Um, this technically, when you use both private keys, it actually has a component that we call bidirectionality. So if you take the inversion of this uh, rekey, yeah, you can send it back. You can send it back. So Bob can decrypt data or in, encrypt data for Alex. Yeah. So it kind of creates that weird little thing there. Um, obviously, it's something we don't want either. So this is like <laughs> what this protocol is. It's not interactive. I'm sorry. It's interactive. Yeah. It's bidirectional. And I it's think like it's also multi-hop. It's been a while since I've listened to the paper. Yeah. I mean, at this point, like if you're doing this, you may as well just create a new key that both of you know and exactly just it. so it never gained traction yeah, yeah but now we actually have ways to build non-interactive proxy encryption we have ways to securely store these keys because you don't want to trust a single would you trust google with this like, no no you wouldn't <laughs> so uh yeah there's there's just no need for that anymore we can do this in a secure setting mm -hmm. uh so you also mentioned when uh so let's say alice sends to bob um and you know puts uh our keys here oh, so, that's the new cypher network yeah that's yeah. the new cypher network and then at the same time alice wants to send to charlie uh -huh. um the same data same data yeah so she's still it's a new new policy new policy new encryption new everything so there's no like today's encrypted the same private key same private key with her private key so she's delegating access if she wants, yeah. She so so the like, let's say the message is IPFS, right? So for Bob, she puts the CA, right? Yeah, she can. She, yeah, she so can she, send both yeah, CA so to now, both. So she just simply calls that. So we call this function granting. So Alice can simply grant. This is a grant. Yeah. So this yeah. is a reiki A to B, reiki A to C. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah. I'll yeah. I'll say this is R K A to B. That's a great way of saying that. Then this is just an R K A. To see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's how that works. It's very scalable, so we find like in multiple parties. Yeah. yeah. It's actually really nice because, you know, depending on the data, we encrypt it once and we can delegate access as needed. Yep. And then when, so what happens when they revoke access privilege? That, that's kind of the question because, like, let's say this data is being updated every day. Being updated every day. Yeah. It's still encrypted under the same key, right? Yeah. No need to even, no need to worry about it. Exactly, but then when you want to revoke access from one of the parties. From one of the parties? You just delete these keys for Bob. And, but then, I mean. Charlie still has access. Charlie still has access to the, to the new data and Bob has only access to the old data pretty much. Well, well not, the, not the keys have changed here. Not the key has not changed. Sorry. So if the key did not change, if Bob, if Bob continues to, to hold on to that key, yeah, yeah, yeah. to the ciphertext, um, he can only re-encrypt. So I'll say this. So this, we have CA. Oh, you said CA1, CA2. Yeah, it's like it's every day right, just right, right. dumping in you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. So, okay, I misunderstood just a little bit there. Um, so in this case, Bob has to perform this re-encryption for new pieces of data. Yeah. So if Alice revokes access to Bob, he can't get the updated data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if the cipher, even if the private key or is the same. I see. And then in this case, but Charlie will continue to have access. So in this, this is that very similar to that Netflix 
So yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So then, like to break into this, you need to like actually go collude with all these guys, yep. recover the private keys this was encoded with. Yeah. And, and then, yeah. then you can have access to that. But of course, you know. Free Netflix right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the, 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 the problem is, too, is that for people who are building this, typically they'll have more complex kind of schemes like mm -hmm. that. Where it's like maybe we do key rotation on yeah, all yeah, the movies yeah. that we encode. Exactly, yeah. Now it's worthless. Yeah. yeah. So what New Cypher is, is this layer two protocol. It's a very low level primitive mm -hmm. uh, for people to start constructing these applications. And our goal is to eventually make this so misuse resistant and so easy that I don't know if, if, if you've taken a look at our libraries before, but we literally call our stuff Alice and Bob, you know, Ursula. And we have these names in our code base mm -hmm. so people know exactly what they're building. Nice they don't need to worry about, you know, who is it. If they want to, they absolutely can, but you know, they don't need to worry about these kinds of things. That way they can always, you know, know, oh, I'm an Alice. Oh, I'm a Bob. I see. You know, and they can figure out exactly who to be in that situation. Sometimes Alice is Bob, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> so I'd rather sometimes Bob is Alice, you know? <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've got some inception right there. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's the, it's pretty uh, straightforward. Yeah, it's pretty nice. I mean, I like it. Uh... Again, very simple cryptography. Probably not. It's like one of the probably more simplistic uh, protocols, mm -hmm. and we just gain a ton of security just from distributing this. Yeah, yeah, just sure. So when when I'm uh, recording the new keys, let's say I'm in Alice in this case, I'm I create this new key, re key for Bob. Um, do I do this on chain when I uh, or do I just send it to them and hope? Send it to them. So we, on chain, what happens is. You just I'll like you, you just send a grand transaction saying yeah, you so, did it, right? So Alice will go to a smart contract, mm -hmm. which has a list of our members. So this is like, yeah, yeah, that's like everybody who staked. Right. Yeah. And so what she calls is like a sample, or or I call them stoke. Yeah, sample per stake. Mm -hmm. Right. And on the output, she'll get a like list of list of nodes. Is it just addresses or? Like, what, what, how do you identify yeah, nodes? Yeah, so addresses, right. Yeah. Okay. But we have a... a, a you have a routing yeah, table? We yeah. So well, we, we don't use a routing table. We use something... We actually published a blog post on this. All right. Um, a lot of people are using peer-to-peer -peer solutions like... Uh, Kademlia uh, stuff? Yeah, like, like Kademlia. DHT. We, did, we started out with Kademlia, but we, it, it turned out it was kind of uh, not great for us to use it that way. Um, DHT is really annoying to handle. There's a lot of security Yeah, issues like I that. know, I know. So we switched to that. <laughs> A lot of people are saying, why don't you use, you know, like, uh, an interplanetary solution? But we were like, we don't need that either. That's, like, all this complexity for something that we don't need. So what we do is, I know it's actually not going to be that massive. Right? Like, at the time, we only imagine a thousand nodes or something. Yeah. We just use a very naive, what we call learning group. We have seed nodes, very similar to how Bitcoin works. Yeah, okay. You just go to one node and say, who do you know about? They tell us the nodes. Yeah. Well, we go to those nodes and say, who do you know about? We did the same thing, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cool. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, you should. We, uh, We'd actually love to share thoughts on that together. We sure, should do yeah. That um, but yeah, so then Alice will go to these nodes and give the re-encryption key to them. So what she does is, this is where she pays. Mm -hmm. Alice will pay here and say, I'm ready to stake, I'm ready to put a policy in. She puts in a deposit for the length of time she wants. Smart contract says, here are some nodes based on the stake and based mm -hmm. on the requirements that you give a stake. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you don't, you only want to have like nodes that are staking over a certain amount. You want them to be like, Secu like yeah, like seriously. They're like, invested. Like, yeah, they're <laughs> invested in the network. I only want people who are you know, staking well over a good amount of money. You can do that. Mm -hmm. So you get out these nodes, and then she goes to each one off chain and says, here's a re encryption key. Back. And then that's it. She records them all into what we call that treasure map. Yeah. Gives that to Bob. Bob will be able to go to those nodes and be like, I am me. This is my proof. I have the keys, blah, 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 blah. And then perform the re encryption and get it out. I see, cool. So Alice does need to run some piece of like client, right, for that to yeah. actually rediscover the nodes and yep. do some stuff. Yeah. yeah. I I guess planning to do that in JavaScript or right now it's like a everything's in Python for us. Oh, in Python. Um, yeah. So we can run. We have a. We're still. We're pretty early with our library tooling. Um, we have a ton of stuff that people have built for us in JavaScript. But something that we built was character control. So if people want to use JavaScript for this, mm -hmm. uh, they can run a node on their uh, platform and then call out to it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, it, we're working on building different ways of doing that. Eventually, we'd like to be able to do just our learning loop 
yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly yeah that's so cool because then you don't need to then do like it, in yeah. the front end yeah just yeah. like it loads a we, little bit and the main thing that we want to try because we something we believe is just the security and the safety of our users and this use resistance part because people are so desperately like i want to encrypt stuff in javascript and like mm -hmm. yes we know you want to encrypt stuff in javascript we know you want to generate re-encryption keys in javascript but it's just not safe enough yet it's just not safe enough we don't like javascript based cryptography I see. Um, there's still a lot of problems with it. And the browser is just not a secure platform. <laughs> that, clearly, uh, you know, we know that it's like, it's just, you know, there's so many vulnerabilities that come out for it all yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah. And for data like this, we just don't want people to do that. Mm -hmm. We'd rather have people, you know, build applications that are specific to that. And then slowly when we gain more assurance and figure out how to do more and more stuff, that's when we can start uh, Add, adding this. Like yeah. That. Yeah. Cool. So maybe a new site for browser extension one day, which mm -hmm. we actually have looked heavily into building, so we can actually call out and using native messaging to communicate with our protocol, yeah. which would be fantastic. So all it requires would be just type on. Yeah, everything, our network, we have our, test, our federated test network up. Uh, we just launched last night our, the beginnings of our decentralized test net, and uh, it's, uh, it's going good uh, so far. Uh, so that's not available for the public quite yet. Uh, <laughs> maybe when this video is published, maybe it will be. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, things are going well. So if people want to test on our network and build stuff on it, they can absolutely do everything I just described. Nice. The, we actually work. So. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah, that was super great. Yeah. Uh, learned a little bit too. So yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. All right. Yeah. Yeah, check it out on. Yeah, oh yeah, so we, we have a Discord. Uh, if you go on our Discord, uh, go on our website, newcypher.com, go on our Discord, and uh, you'll be able to see, uh, join us, see our, all of our development. It all happens in the public, so you can see us having arguments, discussions <laughs> on how to build stuff. Our team's distributed, so that's the main place where we communicate. Um, you can go on there and see the other applications we built. We have an FHE library, so if you know what fully homomorphic encryption is, I'm not going to get into it now, <laughs> but we have the world's fastest fully homomorphic encryption oh, nice. library. Yep. So maybe another time. Another time. Ne uh, next episode. Yeah. yeah. But then after that, we also have all of our documentation there. So in our GitHub. So feel free. Newcypher.com. GitHub.com slash Newcypher. Check us out. Thanks, everybody. Stay tuned for next episodes.